Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the living bread from heaven. Amen. Well, we continue in our story, our account from John chapter 6 this week. And if you recall last week, the message was about earthly bread versus what Jesus was talking about, this bread that endures forever. Because he had this group of people chasing after him because he did this miraculous feat of multiplying five loaves of bread and two fish into enough food to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And it still makes me laugh when I go back and look at the end of that section in verse 15 of chapter 6. It says, because of this, they wanted to make him a king. And so he went away to a desolate place to prevent that from happening. Right. So they were caught up in this presentation of earthly food to relieve their temporary hunger. But it came back. The next day, they're searching for Jesus again so that they can receive this bread because their hunger has returned. And so today we continue in this account because Jesus ends that account by saying that he is this bread that endures forever, that he has come down from heaven, that he is the source of life. And now in this next set of verses, he's going to explain what exactly that means. Because clearly at the end of the text last week, they still don't get it because they say, Sir, give us this bread always. They're still thinking of it as something like a loaf of bread that Jesus can hand to them. But one of the themes in our text today that you'll see come up is that there's a difference between the expectation of the people and the reality of what Jesus is trying to tell them. The reality of what Jesus has come to do. Now it shifts a little bit. They did have a misunderstanding last week about the nature of the bread that Jesus was speaking of, but now they're having even a misunderstanding about who Jesus is himself. So Jesus starts by saying something along the lines of the will of the Father. And he begins there because this is what he has come to do. But this is precisely the thing that the Jewish people who are listening to him don't understand. And imagine yourself in their shoes. Imagine you've never heard of this Jesus, that he's just a man seemingly to you standing in front of you. You don't know about the cross. You don't know about the message of the gospel, which we have received through the written word of God. And Jesus begins to reveal God's plan of salvation, the Father's will for sending his Son. It's bizarre. It's not something we would come up with. But it is, in fact, what Jesus is here to do. So in verse 36, he says that the Father has given all things to him. Or verse 37, rather. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So God is giving him, God the Father is giving all things to Jesus. And then in verse 37, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So he's here to do the will of his Father. And then the logical question after him saying that is, well, what is the will of the Father? And here's what Jesus says. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Now, the people who are listening to Jesus don't quite know what that means yet. Because they don't understand what it is that God has given to Jesus And we do. He has given us to Jesus. He's given people of faith to him. That he's going to lose nothing of all that he has given, but raise it up on the last day. The raise it up on the last day phrase has two foreshadowed meanings here. Jesus is beginning to reveal the will of the Father. And the will of the Father involves the Son of Man being raised up. raised up on the cross. And this also refers to because of that raising up of the Son of Man, we too 
will be raised up on the last day. For now we belong to him, and he will not let us go. So Jesus outlines this, and he begins to reveal his purpose for coming to earth, the purpose for his ministry, which isn't to make bread, but to be raised up, the bread that came down from heaven that is the source of life for the world. He's talking about his flesh, which he ends our reading today with. And before we even get to thoughts about the Lord's Supper, this is directly referring to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the giving of his flesh as the source of all eternal life for the world. That is what you have been given in the crucifixion of Jesus, nothing short than the source of eternal life. That glorious exchange where he takes upon himself our sin and our corrupted flesh, and in return, gives us his eternal life, his relationship with the Father, his perfect righteousness. But the people don't understand what Jesus is talking about, and so they grumble. In verse 41, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They didn't even hear the rest of the stuff about the will of the Father when Jesus said that he is the bread that has come down from heaven. They took issue with that. They took issue with it because they know this guy, right? They say, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? And once again, they don't understand the will of the father, the plan and purpose for Jesus' ministry. But Jesus' response to this misunderstanding is really interesting. Here's what he says. Jesus answered them, Do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now think about that for a moment. Do not grumble amongst yourselves, right? So Jesus is saying, Stop worrying about this. And the reason he's saying, Don't worry about this, is he's saying to them, The ones who have heard and believed are drawn by my Father. He's making a statement about the nature of faith. That faith that draws to him is a gift. It's not something intellectually attained, which is what the Jews were attempting to do, right? That's a rational argument. How can Jesus be the bread from heaven? We've known this guy since he was a child. We know his parents. And so their reason becomes an impediment to their faith. And Jesus points that out. The nature of faith is a gift that only the Father draws those near to him. And those who are drawn near, again, he mentions, will be raised up on the last day. So how does that work then? How does God draw people to himself, to the one he has sent? Well, very often when that reference to faith as a gift is in the scriptures, very soon afterwards, there's reference to, to hearing the word of God. And here it is again. And it is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Those who hear God's word and learn it are drawn to him, are drawn to Jesus. And Jesus then is the only Reliable witness to the Father, right? Have you seen the Father? I haven't seen the Father. Jesus has seen the Father, for he is the one who has come down from heaven to give life to the world. And so Jesus says here that not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. And he's referring to himself. So the words of Jesus are the words of God. They are the thing that draw from the Father to himself as a gift of faith. And then it's culminated, this section of the scriptures is culminated with the verse in 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, which is a linguistic key, like, pay attention, I'm about to say something really important. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever believes in the Father and then the one who is sent by the Father 
who is the only reliable witness about the Father. Whoever believes has eternal life. So Jesus' clarification here, as he can, and this carries over from last week, is that he's not here for temporary half measures. He's not here to satisfy your temporary hunger. Now, in God's great mercy, God also cares about that, and so he does take care of that, but that's not the purpose of his ministry. So Jesus, once again, draws an image back to the Old Testament, the sort of stereotypical image of God's provision of food is the manna in the desert. And he emphasizes again the difference between God's provision and the manna and what he's now providing in Jesus, this new bread of life. Because what does he say about those who ate the manna in the wilderness? They died. But those who eat this new bread will never die. They will live forever. And what is this new bread? Again, we get the I am statement from Jesus. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Now that doesn't mean if you come to communion, you're not going to die an earthly death. But it means that faith in Christ the bread of life coming down from heaven, who's raised up on the cross, whose flesh is given for the life of the world, means that your eternal fate is sealed in life. Life forever. That's why that phrase is repeated, raised up on the last day. Talking about the new kingdom of God, the eternal life we have in Christ. So in John 6 here, he's continuing to foreshadow the pinnacle of his earthly ministry, which is death on the cross. And the people who hear him don't yet understand, his disciples don't fully understand. Because it is a stumbling block, right? As I mentioned to the kids, it's easy to forget what the cross was originally used for because we've gotten so used to seeing it in the context of our churches and on our necklaces and other things like that. But it originally was a cruel device meant to kill the worst of criminals. And God's plan of salvation is that the only perfect human being who ever existed dies in that fashion. And this is what Jesus begins to reveal here in John chapter 6. This is God's will for you. This is God's plan For Jesus, the Son whom he sends, down to earth. So think about that dynamic the next time you think about the love of God that is represented in Jesus. That's what is going on when he sends Jesus from the get-go. That is the plan, that is the will, and Christ knows it as well. This is the Father's will, that he sends his Son to die on the cross, to descend from heaven and offer his flesh the purchase price for your life and the life of all people. Not a fleeting life of 80 years, but an eternal life. He raised Jesus on the last day, or sorry, he raised Jesus on the third day after his death, and he will, because of that, raise you on the last day. You belong to to Jesus. You have been given to him from the Father. So take heart because Jesus tells us today that all the things that have been given to him from the Father, he will never reject any of it. He will never reject you, nor will he lose you. Because this is the will of him who sent him, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day. So in response to that, as followers of Christ, as those who have been drawn by the word of God in faith to believe in Jesus and know why he has come, our response to that is simply, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Amen. 
Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the living bread raised up on the cross for your salvation, and knowing that you have life forevermore when he returns, and he will raise you up on the last day. Amen.